It was in the Han Dynasty that a technological advancement changed the battlefield forever. A single-edged iron sword with slashing and chopping power, more durable in combat than its double-edged predecessors, that kept its edge longer and cut with extreme power. It could be effectively wielded in the hands of a novice and nearly unstoppable in the hands of an expert. This is the Ring Pommel Dao of the Han Dynasty. And though it may appear simple at first glance, it is a true specimen of battlefield technology, metallurgy, and engineering. The Ring Pommel Dao was so effective that it became the sword of choice for both soldier and commander and continued its reign for centuries and dynasties to follow. It was the sword that tamed the Hezhi Corridor in the hands of Wei Qing and Huo Chubing. It was the sword that was made popular by heroes of the Three Kingdoms, like the human Goliath Dian Wei, and could have been the possible green dragon crescent blade of the god of war himself, Guan Yu. So let's take a closer look at this Ring Pommel Dao and its historical impact both on and off the battlefield in today's episode of Han Dynasty Weapons. The exact date of the first Ring Pommel Dao is unknown. However, we can find records of its existence in mass and as a standard weapon for military use in the Han Dynasty over 2,000 years ago. This was also a time of metallurgic advancements that emphasized the use of iron alloys, creating sharper and more durable blades. One of the other benefits of the Iron Age is that swords could be made longer. So this not only gave you an advantage on foot where you could reach your opponent much closer, but as well on horseback, you could actually swing down and strike opponents on the ground as well as other opponents on horseback. One of the unique design aspects about the Han Dynasty Dao is that it was really made for chopping. And you can see this in this recurve design where the blade actually uh, curves inward towards the edge itself. This is not something that continues on through later dynasties as we see straight blades into the, the Sui and Tang dynasties and Song dynasties, and then an outward curving blade that we see in the Ming and Qing dynasties. But it's really a testament to how this weapon was used on the battlefield. And yes, armor is one reason for that, to have lots of chopping power, but the other reason is actually stirrups or the lack thereof, because stirrups weren't invented for a couple hundred years after this sword was. That means that horseback fighting was pretty much based on hit and run tactics, which suits this blade perfectly. You ride up on the enemy at high speed, get a good weighted swing, and hopefully lop something off in passing. I mean, this is again, goes back to the design of the recurve here because it puts the cutting and chopping edge of the blade in optimal alignment with its target. Horseback warfare was a main method of fighting, especially on the borderlands against the nomadic tribes of the Xionu, who excelled at riding and had a surplus of stout, sturdy, step steeds, whereas the Han Empire had a very limited supply of any horses. That is why the efforts of Wei Qing and Huo Chubing in securing the Hezhi Corridor were so important because they allowed uh, both troops and envoys to traverse the Gobi Desert and to seek allies in the West to hopefully fight the Xionu. There is an incredible story about a man named Zhang Qian who acted as a peaceful envoy on the orders of the emperor to travel westward and to try to find um, allies to fight against the Xionu. And along his journey, he was captured and kept with the Xionu for almost 10 years. And he was able to escape and complete his journey, making it all the way to Bactria and the Fergana Valley, where he found China's secret weapon, the ancestor to today's Akalteke horse, the Fergana horse, or as the Chinese called it, the heavenly horse. Now at this point, the Bactrians were peaceful people and they didn't have any interest in joining the Han Chinese in fighting against the Xionu, nor did they want to supply any of their heavenly horses to the cause. So this led to Zhang Tian going back empty-handed. 
however, with the knowledge of these incredible horses, which led to the Han Emperor sending out troops, and thus began the War of the Heavenly Horse. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail here about that. Uh, there's a great video made by Chad Eisner, and I will leave a link to that video in the description down below. And I highly recommend you to check that out. It is a very fascinating time, and it really shows the importance of these horses. They could run faster, and they were stronger horses, which really outclassed the steppe horses when it came to the battlefield and warfare. I'll just sum it up and say that in the end, China got their horses, which were superior to the nomadic steppe horses, both in strength, stamina, and agility. This not only led to them repelling the Shonu, but being able to reclaim the Han Empire. Now let's have a quick moment to take a look at the Han Dynasty Long Cavalry Dao made by L.K. Chen. Now this is called the Heavenly Horse, and it is a one-to-one -one high fidelity reproduction of an existing Han Dynasty sword. Now, I've been working with this sword for a couple of months, and I have to say it is a hell of a sword. It really has weight and authority in the swing, it has great chopping power, and it makes the craziest whipping noise when the hand turns over. It's absolutely wild. Now, for the cavalry side, well, I haven't been on horseback since I was a child, and it's not like I'm just going to stroll up to a stable, hop on a horse, and swing this thing around. I don't think that anybody would let me do that. However, LK Chen has connected with people that are very skilled on riding horseback and using swords and weapons. And in fact, LK Chen himself has elevated his own skills to be able to do archery and pole arms and swordsmanship on horseback. So that side's pretty much covered. Luckily for me, the Long Dao is commonly used on foot as well, so I can actually add something to this conversation too. It is a Dao after all, and so pretty much all standard Dao techniques work with this sword. The main difference is being the length of the sword and as a byproduct, the weight. Now the ring pommel offers no added weight or counterbalance, which makes this sword uh, very heavy in the cut. It's very forward pulling. So it's really important that you don't want to try to fight it or try to stop the momentum of the sword. Rather, you want to be able to continue and control the momentum, which leads to two very important Tao techniques in particular, wrapping and swinging. So as I mentioned, once you get this blade in motion, it's going to have a lot of momentum. So we have to be able to control that. And not only to uh, prepare ourselves for after the cut and safely return the blade to a controlled position, but this can also help us generate power before the cut. So the first technique is swinging, and it's pretty simple. We're just going to create like a propeller up above the head. Now this comes from the arm, the elbow, the wrist, the shoulder. And this is just used to control the blade to generate some power. And of course, when you're ready, you sling it into action, cut, and then return it back up. So this one's definitely the easier of the two. And I would suspect that it was the more commonly used version, especially on horseback. It's important to remember that although you may be swinging it overhead in one particular direction, it doesn't limit you to one plane of motion for swinging. So we're just continuing the momentum, but we can easily go into a vertical chop or a diagonal chop or change directions. It's just from this position, we already have momentum generated and we're ready to go into any kind of cut that we desire. The other technique is wrapping, which requires a little bit more of a coordination and practice to be able to do effectively. Now, instead of just doing the continuous motion over the head, after the cut has been made, the hand is going to turn over, resting the blade spine safely and softly on the forearm. The cool thing here is that as the hand turns over, it transfers a lot of energy through the blade. So even at full speed, it can uh, flip it, release that energy, and then it can safely rest it against the forearm without actually slamming it into the arm. So after that comes around, the arms can be raised up, the blade can be placed behind the back, and then an attack can be made from the same direction. 
Doesn't mean that it always has to be. You can flip the blade over and then bring it back around and safely around the head again to the next cut. But one of the other things that makes this very useful as, com as compared to the uh, overhead swinging technique is that we can generate a little bit of extra momentum by using the body as a fulcrum. So after I cut and the blade flips over, I bring it over my head. Now I can use my body as a fulcrum to slingshot the blade into the next cut. And it really doesn't matter what position we're in. We can use multiple parts of the body to end up slinging the blade around at higher speeds for a stronger, more authoritative cut. In my experience with this sword, it is a real beast. It takes some skill to use this sword safely, so I wouldn't recommend buying a sharpened version and trying to just pick it up and swing wildly and try to mimic what you see in this video. You should take the time to learn how to properly swing a regular sized dowel or at least a stick before even touching this one, even if you get the blunt version. This sword generates a lot of momentum and can do a tremendous amount of damage to whatever it hits, whether on purpose or accidentally. Because of its size and lack of decorations, it can be easily overlooked and even called simple. But every component from the handle wrapping to the belt loop, the fit and finish of the scabbard, and the pure engineering and artistry in the blade itself, it's all practical. There are no bells and whistles needed. This sword is commanding and really quite beautiful when you take the time to look at it up close. All right, so that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed taking a closer look at the LK Chen Heavenly Horse Long Cavalry Dao. Um, I think it's an absolutely beautiful sword and I hope you learned something. Uh, if you do get the chance, I'm going to leave some links down below in the description. One is going to be the LK10 website, so you can actually hop on over and take a look at this sword. Uh, you can look at the metal composition and even order one for yourself if you'd like. I will also leave a link to Chad Eisner's video about the War of the Heavenly Horse. Uh, it's a really fascinating time, and I really just barely glossed over it. Um, I will leave another link below that about... Um, the, the warrior Wei Qing and uh, Huo Chu Bing and their time in the Hoji Corridor because it's got a lot that goes on uh, in establishing a safe and secure uh, corridor for travel for the Silk Road trade routes. And lastly, I'm going to leave one more link to a cool History Bros video about Zhang Qing and his travels. Uh, he's the one that uh, ended up <laughs> having to uh, getting caught and held prisoner by the Xionu, escaping and actually getting caught again and having to escape a second time before he made it to Bactria to find the Fergana horses and meet the Bactrians. And uh, it's, there's a lot more to that story and it's quite fascinating as well. So be sure to check that out. And lastly, if you have this sword, uh, speak up. Let me know what you think about it. Do you use it for cutting? Do you use it for forms training? Do you use it for sparring? Or do you just use it to preserve history and have it as uh, something you display? I'd love to hear about it. Love to hear your thoughts about it and uh, any other resources that you can share too to where people can learn more about this time and this sword. So let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching the video, especially to this point. Make sure to hit that like button, subscribe, and all of that jazz. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I'll see you in the next episode.